in basic sciences. It's very clear that in software it was, I think, ahead of it in, in many areas. Um, and that many of the issues around open scholarship um, in the arts and science is much more complex than the arts, straight medicine and science. So, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing that aspect. One thing I forgot to say, that a big part is if you'd like to tweet, please tweet to OA Week. I will be answering questions if you want to tweet them to my, uh, my uh, Twitter handle, which is Open Access Oz, and uh, we'll have some questions hopefully from the audience. Thank you. So, um, great to see so many people here. Um, I'm not sure how many people are here from the creative arts. Put your hands up. I expect about one. one <laughs> two. Excellent. <laughs> so I'm speaking to you, um, and of course to everybody else. Um, but I think there's a, an interesting perspective, hopefully, that you can get from, um, uh, from artistic research um, as part of this. And, and really, the title of my talk here, A Culture of Dissemination, I think sums, sums it up. The, the arts are, are very used to trying to get their work out there, you know, public performances and exhibitions, and, you know, just being crazy on the street or doing something really, you know. And it's sort of very unacademic somehow, you know, instead of just beavering away, you know, in your, in your thing. So hopefully there's a perspective there which, um, which comes through as we go. Um, as was said in the introduction, my primary background is in digital arts, um, in particular in music and sound, and so you'll see that bias as we go. But I'm hoping you'll see that there's, um, there's a transference um, across other disciplines as we, as we move through that. <clears throat> so just um, a little bit of background, just to paint the picture. So talking particularly about creative arts research, um, the arts, of course, generally positioned within the humanities, and so there's a lot of um, the same kind of work which will be done in, uh, in humanities, work in sociology, and history, and geography, and these kinds of, of areas. Not so much um, in the way of quantitative data um, and so forth, except of course uh, in front of you have someone who's working in computation, and so um, we'll get probably more of that than you might otherwise get. Um, as a result, but you know, this is a, an image from a from a project uh, which I was involved with several years ago, and it kind of captures a lot of things. There's there's participants out of the community that are involved here. This is a computational arts uh, activity, so there's some computers, there's a video camera filming people doing things to grab that kind of qualitative data. We've got um, some of the people behind uh, uh, parents and others of them are researchers. And you really can't tell the difference. Um, you know, observing the activities that are going on. And so there's a lot of observation. The computers are collecting data about what the, the, the kids are doing and so forth. And this is all part of a community workshop at the Brisbane Powerhouse um, during the school holidays. And you know, this sort of just gives you a, a flavour and a character of the kind of uh, research which is ongoing. And I'll show you some videos of some things which look a little bit more formal than that um, as we go. I think another, given that there's only two people from the credit arts, it's probably useful to um, just highlight a little bit of the research context in which we're talking here. So when we're looking at um, the era categories uh, for, say, the 19 coded um, FOR areas, for example, um, then these are the kinds of research outputs that we're looking at. So when we're talking about publishing these things or making them available openly um, to people, then we've got to consider all of these kinds of media forms. Uh, and again, one of the things which is interesting about the creative arts is that it can be media rich. Um, and so that provides all sorts of opportunities, but also challenges around getting media out and getting you know, activities out. But as you can see, as well as all the standard you know, verdict-like publications, there's live performances, ritual creative works, um, curation, and so forth and so on. So this list just gives you a flavour of what that's about. 
But really I'm going to focus this narrative around my own work and give you some, some uh, examples of things that I've done and I'm doing and, and hopefully you can uh, t transfer things from there. So first of all, my um, kind of research practice <coughs> is in this area, creativity and computation. So I'm interested in understanding uh, creativity. Um, I do that frequently by trying to do computational models of creativity um, or computational models with which people are interacting and therefore expanding their creativity. The practice that you can see here is called live coding. It's a kind of crazy uh, creative practice where you write software on stage in front of an audience like yourself um, uh, which creates the artwork on the fly. Um, so you basically start with a blank text editor and you start writing software um, and that software creates um, music in this case um, on two digitally controlled pianos in this case um, in real time and off you go. So this practice of live coding is kind of a bit extreme, you know, <laughs> in one sense, but it's kind of intentionally so. Um, uh, part of the, the research activity of it is to try and push forward the kind of uh, artistic practice, you know, move this into new directions. What is possible? What's feasible? Um, how do we do this? What are the problems that we encounter? And then to try and unpack that and, and tease that out um, as we go. Um, the people that get most freaked out about this are the computer scientists um, because, you know, they just can't imagine actually doing their coding on stage in front of a few hundred people. <laughs> you know, if I really want to freak out, I have this great story about uh, myself and a colleague of mine, Andrew Sorensen, who is very, very famous in this area and going all, goes all around the world to do these things. In fact, next week he's in Korea and then a few weeks later he's at a supercomputing conference um, uh, in the US. But anyway, last year, no, two years ago, we were booked as the kind of entertainment <laughs> for a conference dinner at, the, at a computer science conference at the Brisbane Convention Centre. And these things are huge, you know, like two or three thousand people or something crazy like that at this conference. So it's this big banquet thing, so we're up there live coding and, and uh, fortunately there was two of us because Andrew's computer crashed <laughs> and burned, you know, and he's sitting there with sweat pouring down, you know. <laughs> Your scientists in the audience are going, that doesn't look quite right, you know, because uh, when you do this, you project your screen. So it is dangerous and it is risky, like all life and the practice, um, but nevertheless. So the question is, well, you know, how's this research and what do we do? But before we get into that too much, let me just uh, share with you a short video which shows a very simple um, live coding performance so you actually understand what this is about. So it's called Sati Study. Uh, Eric Sati is a composer from about 100 years ago um, who wrote music in a, in a type of style. And so the objective here is to say, well, can we represent that style of music in computational algorithms? You know, how, do we, how do we articulate that musical style in some computer code? Secondly, of course, we need to be able to do that in as succinct <coughs> computer code as possible because I don't have time to type much more than half a dozen lines. Right? So it has to be very succinct. Um, so there's all these kinds of musical challenges um, as we go. So let me just see if this mouse is going to do what it to do. Perfect. Um, so it's way longer than we can possibly watch, but I'll just let it start um, and then just move forward as it goes. So this is a Yamaha Disclavia piano, which is, can be controlled from the computer. Ooh. And this is just jumping to screenshots, so you'll see the camera angle. So this is what I'm seeing. This is me typing. And so, of course, it starts very simply because, you know, that's all you can do when you start. Um, and then it needs to elaborate. Oh, second note. In case you haven't caught on, the piano is actually playing. Uh, but 
scale, triad, key, pitch, with these kinds of terms. Anyway, so I'm on that go, so let me just jump into sort of the middle of it somewhere. It's where it gets to. is that you do all these experiments and the data from them is input and then the outputs of your publications are things that are counted by her data, journal articles and books and chapters and things like that. So you've got this kind of, somehow this kind of workflow that all this experimental work is input and then this publication work is output. The problem in the arts is, well, is that performance, like is that an output or is it an input? Like is it an experiment in how to do this thing or is it a demonstration of how it can be done? Uh, in my view, it's exactly both of those things simultaneously. Um, and so I think this is an, an interesting thing to think about when we're talking about research publications, research outputs, research publication, making things accessible and just, you know, disseminable. So part of the, one of the things I think I said in my video, if anybody saw it, which was introduction to this, was that sometimes you need to make, you need to expose things which you're not all that proud of. You know, experiments that didn't work things like that, and that can be actually quite tricky. You know? So you've got to have this philosophy that everything you're doing as part of your source process is up there and out there, publicly available for people to look at and critique and see, and that includes things that you think went well and things that didn't go well. Um, and of course, we're walking this tightrope in live performance in many cases, um, and that doesn't always go well either. You know? It was 2004 last, last year, we had a concert, using some of this software and so forth, and the whole computer thing just went a bit berserk and couldn't stop it. Basically, they just went pull the plug out to stop it. No, it's quite embarrassing. Um, you know, uh, many people in the audience didn't notice, thankfully. But nevertheless, you know, these things can happen and they don't quite always work um, as you'd like. But that's kind of part of the process. And I think part of the issue for many creative arts researchers is to understand how their creative practice is both an input and an output, and sometimes functions as one or the other and or both. Um, and people are often confused when they look at the creative arts research and go, well, what are your outputs? People say, well, I did this concert and blah, blah, blah. what's not an output, that's an input, and then, then everyone gets confused and doesn't, you know, it's both. Um, so, what are the kinds of outputs? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is to 
to range through a bunch of the different outputs um, that are associated with this work and, and how they kind of unpack from that practice. So of course there are performances and exhibitions. Um, what you saw from me before was just sort of in a studio under a controlled environment that was not with in front of a live audience. Um, but we often do those um, live performances like the photo I showed myself from last year. This one was from a few weeks ago. Um, where we do these performances showing off the latest iterations of our systems and unpacking that work. There are, of course, um, uh, visual art exhibitions as well, not just the music that's got a lot of live performances, but also exhibitions. This one is on right now. If you want to go and see it when we're finished, you're more than welcome in the Griffith University Art Gallery, which is just around the corner here, 50 metres away, up at QCA. This uh, exhibition is called Experimental Thinking, Design Practices. So it's an exhibition of, of uh, innovative design kind of ideas and works. Um, and in the image behind the uh, cover of the, the catalogue is um, a work of mine, which is this visual art one on the left, which has got a pair of headphones next to it, just so you know it's connected to music somehow. Um, it's an audio visual work. Uh, which renders in real time, and it's, the whole thing's computer generated, even the images are real time computer generated. So that's that kind of work and exhibition activities. Um, along with this exhibition uh, was a series of um, workshops and talks and discussions about experimental practices in design, about design research, um, and these kinds of things. So the, again, these, these things count in one sense as outputs because they're public demonstrations of their work, but they also are part of the iterative process of, of uh, experimenting with the work and putting things out there to see how they go. So, as a result, we, um, we actually generate, as part of this work, a whole bunch of online of media. So, video documentation um, of these performance activities are really important because, again, they're ephemeral. So, you know, it's fine, there are some people in an audience who might see your research output, if it's there. But if you're going to disseminate it widely, you obviously need to document that performance and then distribute that. Um, and so documentation is a big thing, you get a lot of video material. Um, and so it's typical for research projects in my area to have something like this, which is a YouTube channel, which just has a whole bunch of um, videos um, publicly available um, around the work. So this one is on what's called SIMS research. SIMS stands for Controlling Interactive Media Systems um, Research. Uh, sorry, Interactive Music Systems Research. Um, so this is an ARC Discovery funded project. And this is um, the, uh, one of the outlets for informal distribution of things. We don't get any official credit for any of this stuff, but it just gets it out there and it makes it part of the community. So when we do performances, um, they typically go up there. Other, other colleagues of ours around the world are doing similar things, so it gives us an opportunity to check out what each other's doing um, and, and see what's going on. Because um, you, sort of, you can imagine right, reading a paper about piano performance is not quite ideal, um, as you can imagine. So. And we might even just mention that, of course, having this kind of rich media content as part of any online um, open access system, of course, is very critical. So, um, as well as video stuff, we've got audio things, and so this is my SoundCloud um, page, um, and has outputs similarly organized, um, and you can have as many of those things as a Vimeo page, and as a blog, and blah, and blah, and blah. The point is just online distribution of, of your work. Um, so another aspect of my research is that it's um, computational, involves writing software, and so there's, of course, not just the distribution of the music or the artworks that result, but the distribution of the source code um, of the software that accompanies that, because in a sense, a lot of the investigation is actually into algorithm development. Um, and so, you know, you can talk about those algorithms in, in journal articles and so forth, and we certainly do do that. Um, but being able to distribute the software um, is also an important part of the process. Um, and the major 
area for doing that, of course, is these days is on GitHub, which is for open access for um, open source software distribution. And so our projects typically will um, upload, will we'll open up a GitHub response repository for the project and the source code will be there. It serves a few purposes. Um, distribution is one of them, and in fact, it's probably actually a fairly minor one, to <coughs> Frank. The major one is, is about collaboration, because it means that our research team can all check in the latest version of the software and all of the functions that go along the software development in terms of version control and keeping things going. We've got this history of all the changes that have been made, so we can roll back to previous versions when we need to write a paper about well, what happened at this stage and how do we change those things when we can roll back to an earlier version of the software, see those things. Um, and it allows us um, globally to to have our research team which is working on a single software project um, and do that. Um, another interesting thing which I noticed on this screenshot, down at the very bottom you'll see um, there's a thing that says open, so create journal technology and education. Um, that interestingly is a uh, an open job for me <laughs> um, on um, creating styles for uh, the Zotero um, what's it called? database management. Sorry? Bibliographic, whatever, like, uh, database system. So that's a, Zotero is probably one of those, and I'm of course one of those, which is what I use. Um, and I'm currently editing a special issue of a journal. The journal is called Journal of Music Technology and Education. And as I came to do that, of course, there's no style sheet for that particular. So I had to cobble one up. So once I cobbled it up, then I, they've got a GitHub repository where all of those are, are maintained. So we can contribute to that to the thousands of others that are there. So it's just another example of the kind of ability to share this, this kind of work. Uh, you don't have to be a coder to do that, of course. It's just as long as you can you know, know where a comma goes or something like that. So getting to things which are probably more general for everybody, of course, text publications. Here I can skip through because I'm sure many other speakers will talk much more about this. Um, there's nothing really uh, special about the text publications in my field that's going to be different from yours or anybody else. Um, they follow a very similar pattern of, of things. So I just thought I'd highlight some interesting things that have come up. Uh, this one recently, the Journal of Creative Music Systems. Um, so the, the research we're doing around these computational processes are called creative music systems, <laughs> um, interactive music systems, actually. Um, and so the, this is a new um, open access journal um, which has just started up in this area just to show how it's kind of flourishing. Um, and the call for the inaugural issue, and we're not finished here, I need to go back to my office and start with the <laughs> But it's clear that these things are, are expanding all across the area. Um, another journal in my space which has been doing some interesting things um, a little bit longer um, is this one, the Empirical Musicology Review. Um, empirical Musicology uh, is the sort of thing which gets a score of a Beethoven sonata and does a whole bunch of analysis on it, and, you know, measures of rules and uh, those all sorts of things. Um, well, usually measures of the computer system, but nevertheless, measures it um, and does all this kind of empirical work on you know, how many times Beethoven used a major chord rather than a minor chord and got a whole paper on that, the meaning of life. Um, and a lot of the, the work uh, that I've done in some of the other projects leading up to the one I've just been showing you about were in this area. Uh, but the thing about this journal is for quite some time, it's you can see it's peer reviewing process and open access policies are there. The interesting thing was the peer reviewing um, is all publicly available um, alongside the articles um, and there are commentaries which are written about every article um, as those articles are published. And I actually think that's a really, a really good idea um, uh, because you know, you, if you're going to say something about somebody's thing, it might as well be as public as the article itself. Um, and that this seems to have a really good debate. Uh, and this is an example of people looking for it um, of a kind of a journal which has that kind of approach and as you can see the, um, all the articles are immediately freely available by open access. So sometimes it's good to have these kinds of examples if you're trying to start one up in your field. Um, 
And of course, um, stuff's put up on the university prints um, process. I'm sure we're all doing that. Um, and as you can see, this is just an example of one of mine from Griffith, where I work. Um, you know, techniques of generating melodies inspired by music cognition, published early this year in the Computer Music Journal. So that's that's kind of more of some of the informal and some of the formal stuff around the journal articles. Back to sort of less formal stuff. Um, along with keeping these project-based um, online repositories of media and stuff, uh, of course I think it's really important to maintain your own website um, and your websites for projects that you're on so that people can find out information on um, what you want to do. In one sense, the kind of major currency for, for academics is fame. So <laughs> you're either famous or you're not. Um, and so you, you have a look up in the top right hand part of the screen, you can see the categories of pages that are on my website, stuff about my music, my art, my programming code, <coughs> ideas, it's more about the research based um, intellectual things, supervision of HDR students, publication list, and, and, a, and a blog. And the blog is used just to kind of explore ideas uh, which aren't kind of formal enough really to put into a journal article, put them out there, get a bit of feedback, and that's kind of a really useful process. And that's just sort of getting these ideas together, see which things you know, really fire interest amongst people or otherwise. Um, this is a, another website for uh, a previous ASE discovery project, um, Smart Music Research Project, which was the one where we were publishing in that empirical musicology journal. Um, and so um, that just gives you an example of making sure that, that the ongoing processes of these projects are, are kept available and current um, online. And of course, social media outlets. So in this case, um, I have this book published, Sound Musicianship, Understanding the Craft of Music. Um, and so that book, and there's, a, there's some courses as part of programs here at um, Griffith University called In Sound Musicianship. Um, and so there's kind of a, a Twitter feed for um, this particular project and its book and quotes from the things and people talking about it. Um, and that all kind of comes together under, so in a sense, this kind of book project has its own social media kind of life as we go. So that's kind of my that's kind of it for me. This is my summary. Um, that you know creative arts um, I think are wide ranging in their application of these kinds of things a bit interesting because of the media outcomes that there are. Uh, this notion that something which is created as part of the research process is part of a cyclical development. It's not necessarily only an outcome or only an input that it, that it functions as both of those things. And the creative arts have a, a culture of um, working together. In music, we call it an ensemble or a band. Right? Um, many people call it a team. You know. um, we can put on an opera with lots of people. We can create a film. Just have a look at the list of the people who are on the film credits, right? Crazy amounts of organization we get collaboration going. The arts are pretty good at that. Um, and then a culture of dissemination through you know, getting out into the public, performing, exhibiting, doing these things as, as a part of the culture of the creative arts, and I think academics can learn something from that and take up um, that as part of their culture as well. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fascinating, actually, and I think it exemplifies how a lot of what you're doing is so far ahead of what's happening in um, you know, the sciences. I mean, it's just a delight to hear about open peer review being something that people want to do in collaboration and it's something that people want to do. I, need to, I think I feel like I need to drag a few geneticists into the room and make them do that. Um, let's do a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll perhaps have some more at the end. Any, any burning questions? Perhaps I can just ask. I actually have a yeah. comment. And so oh, this is interesting. We'll just see who you are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I have to work it. So a um, comment about um, process. Right? So talking about what's an input and what's an output. And I actually think it might be, and my background is neuroscience, so I think it might be really useful to reflect some of your comments back onto the processes that the scientists, the folks in the research field, also engage in. Because I think one could argue that 
the same thing apply to some of the research processes that a neuroscientist might engage with in the lab? You know, what is an input? Is there some structure to the experiment itself um, that we might want to start changing a little bit the way that we understand how we publish and share and collaborate with certain things? It isn't just the paper, it's really how do we get to the paper? Um, so I think there's some learning um, that can happen here between the arts and the sciences about the way that we understand inputs and outputs. And really, one of the questions I guess I would have is do we really want to talk about research outputs or more something on the order of creative works where we can kind of bring into all of that all of what we do in this space, the process by which we get to the next place or in collaboration. So I just, I'm not going to challenge the audience to use all the time. I think that we're not so different. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. Um, and uh, the, like creative works, of course, is that internally within the arts, that's the term that we would use. Yeah. Research outputs is, the only, is only a term we use because it's imposed upon us by a year and other things. Um, so yeah, we would talk about that. Another interesting um, thing to bring into that conversation, I think, would be this book by Andrew Pickering, who talks exactly about this in the sciences. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the book, but Andrew Pickering is definitely the author, 2010, right now. Um, but he, he did a survey of all sorts of methods in the sciences um, and came up with a similar conclusion that, that this kind of notion that there was some kind of linearity to this was, was a myth and that rather it was you know, an iterative cycle and he just underscores that. So, you know, I'm sure we'll get one. Sati, you should probably know, uh, to use Dominguez and Crescendo. He had two great notations in his music which resonate with this talk. One is, open your head. Yep. And the other one is arm yourself with the scarcity. And how would you translate that musical interpretation of his music into coding? So, I don't know that you can as a direct um, thing, but not by line by line. What you need to do is to unpack what that means in terms of actions that you would take as a pianist, as a performer, as a musician or a composer, and then try and actually model those, those actions and behaviours. So I don't think you're modelling directly those kinds of abstract ideas, but you're modelling the behaviours which exemplify them. One question, Michael, and I'm just going to get the next talk up, so it's the same who you are. Who are you? Right. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting I think what I was trying to say is that one event or one thing <coughs> can be can serve as both. So, um, say take the concerts which we put on as part of this work um, in interactive music systems. So those concerts are outputs in the sense that they are demonstrations of the capacity we've built thus far and the kinds of knowledge that we've developed. So they serve as demonstrations of that in the same way that a published text paper will serve as an articulation of something which has been found. But in addition, we're always videoing them, interviewing the performer who took part. They become part of the data collection process for the next cycle as we move through. So you just, you just frame them uh, as required for the different kinds of circumstances. Great. Thank you very much. That was tremendous. Search to discover antibiotics capable of combating superdrugs, which is something that's in the 
you know, in the, in the news media a lot, and I think that it's something to truly come to light as a global problem. I think it's a fantastic example of where collaboration is absolutely essential. So. Hello, how are we doing? <laughs> Who's having a good day? <laughs> ah, it's pretty good. Who's taken drugs before? <laughs> oh, I'll be honest, they're on the live camera, it's okay. <laughs> So that's an open question, right? Drugs and drugs. But seriously, who's taking a drug? There we go. Different question, right? Just add the A and everyone puts their hands up. Who's taken antibiotics before? Right. Who's not had an antibiotic in their life? Put your hand up. Zero, right? So this is something completely different. Although I like the music, I play Sati. My wife teaches over here. Excellent. I'll introduce you later. A pianist. Um, and in the framework of open. Uh, access. Um, there are many ways you can interpret that, but there are many close frameworks. So one into analysis is, you know, what are the paradigm models here and what they work for? So the, the closed framework model I'll be talking about is the pharmaceutical industry. It's a very big industry. I like it. Um, they get a bad rap all the time. The drugs are too expensive. They're all evil. But without modern medicine and pharmaceuticals, you know, most of us would probably die at the age of 40 to 50, right? So, and this particular issue we're going to be talking about drugs for superbugs. So who in the audience would like to tell me what a superbug is? It's biologically resistant. An antibody resistant? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. All right. So viruses don't cause infections, but about um, 170 Australians every week will die from bacterial sepsis, which is the severe form of infection. So I'll say that 170 Australians every week will die. <laughs> That's more than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and homicides and carotids combined. But you never hear that number. Uh, it's one of these classic examples where the media will go after a frenzy of swine flu because it's in the news, or Ebola, or you know, these things are very, very media worthy. But day on day, year on year, the number of people dying from bacterial infections is going up. So to understand what's happening in the future, of course, it's always good to look at the past. And before the advent of antibiotics, and after sanitation and clean water, antibiotics have probably saved more lives than any other single invention we've had on the planet today. And we've, we've forgotten this. My father was born in 1939. Uh, two of his siblings died from pneumonia uh, at early ages. Um, so about one in three Australians in 1930 would die from an infection before the age of 30. Globally now, a lot of children under five still die from very simple diarrhea, pneumonia, infections that we don't worry about so much in the West. This is a, a data set here, set aside, uh, commissioned by Dave Sunny Davis and David Cameron in the UK, from Jim O'Neill, who used to work in the World Bank. He's pretty good, he knows his stuff. And it just shows you the number of deaths predicted by 2050 if we do nothing per hour. Okay, so, you know, they're big numbers, um, but, you know, this is where we're heading. So at the moment, infection is the second leading cause of death globally. It's not in OCD countries for us. It's still cardiovascular. In most of our diseases, to be honest, we should be spending more on preventative health care because they're mainly lifestyle related. Diet related, diary related alcohol, tobacco, and weight. Those, those four things can reduce our disease burden enormously. Um, and that's up to us, right, as consumers and the industry providing us with the appropriate food and regulation. But you can't do much about infection. If you get an infection, you get an infection. So, it is a serious threat. Um, it is an economic burden. And again, if you look at our healthcare costs and demographics in Australia, every day someone spends an ICU or it's costing the government between eight and twelve thousand dollars. The number you can't just keep on building more beds. If someone gets an infection, they bring it to the hospital, or more often you go into the hospital for chemotherapy or a hip replacement or a knee surgery, you will pick up a non succumbent infection or hospital acquired infection, you're then in the hospital and the costs just go through the roof. So it costs the government's money. And the other sad part of the story is whilst this problem is growing and becoming significant morbidity, mortality, and economic burden to society, we are doing nothing. We are walking away from the problem. So the number of pharmaceutical companies now working in this space is about four. Uh, and 20 years ago, it was in the, the 20s. Um, we used to make about 12 antibiotics every year. Now we're lucky to find them like every four or five years. We've only had about four or five in the last 40 years. So there's good reasons for that, um, and I won't go into those in detail. But basically, pharmaceutical companies are for profit uh, institutes, and in the capitalist system, that's the way it works. Drug discovery is very hard and very risky. It takes about 1.2 billion on average to get a drug to market. 
and they will make money out of lifestyle drugs because you'll take a hypertensive drug or a Prestol lowering reagent or an inflammation arthritis reagent for the rest of your life. Antibiotics are miracle drugs. We've forgotten how powerful they are. You get an infection which could have killed you and in two weeks you feel better. And that's the problem for the economics because you're only taking that drug for a short period. So we can sit there and say, pharma, you're crap, get back into this. Well, no, we have to change the rules. We've got to change the economics. We also have to think about the farm model. So how do pharmaceutical companies discover drugs for the musicians in the audience? Let's we'll answer that. All right? I'll ask that. Okay. So <laughs> basically, they, they start with a closed collection. And a closed collection, in this case, is molecules. So each pharmaceutical company will have a library of between one and two million molecules. A molecule is a chemical, it's usually a small molecule, that's suitable eventually to become a drug that you put in your mouth that can affect disease. But those collections are private, they're closely held. One of the drivers of m and in the industry is actually combining the libraries. But I can't access them. As a researcher, I may have a brilliant idea, a great target, I may have the next cure for Parkinson's disease, but I can't go to screen libraries. So people with innovation struggling to access that first step. And that has been the model for the last 60 years. So we're trying to do something that's a little bit challenging. So if we look at any program discovery, we basically need to do something different. And with the advent of global communications and the internet, we can actually scale this really quickly, which is something we can do in any endeavor. And what we're going to do now is actually look at the community. And so if you analyze what's been done, we're trying to lower the access, uh, access to, uh, to um, uh, to screening and provide a free open access platform so scientists all around the world can start to look for the next new antibiotic. In addition to empower those researchers and also empower the research community, we want to create an open access database because we don't really understand what properties of a molecule make an antibiotic. There are many rules in drug discovery that says if you do this and you do that, it will become highly available or get into the brain. But in this space, antibiotics are weird and wonderful molecules. We don't fully understand how to design those. So in order to empower people and you know, learn more about how to find the next new antibody, which we're not doing very well at the moment, we need a database. And then the other thing is um, there's value in standardization. So you know TCP, ICP, wireless, again there's lots of standards, right? They're incredibly powerful. And once again in this particular space, people that are doing it this way in Mexico and this way in Queensland and this way in, in Russia, there's no standardization. And just by standardizing we should get benefits to the community as well. So that's COAD. Um, let's go back to how it used to happen as well. So if you go back to, so the first antibiotics ever actually came from Germany, that's the sulfur drugs, I've not talked about too much, and now the power is you've got to open wounds. Then of course there's penicillin. And everyone knows Howard Florey, Nobel Prize winner, um, together with Shane and, and Fleming, um, they saved more lives in World War II than was possible before. More soldiers died from infections in World War I than they did from bullets and bombs. But what happened before, there were no real barriers. So in this case, uh, we had a collaboration from a professor and a company. Here we had a compound coming from Venezuela that was sent across. Um, so these are antibiotics we use today, tetracycline, chlorophenicol, vancomycin was um, an interesting story. There was a um, reverend colony, uh, he's actually a reverend for the US um, uh, airborne division, and he parachuted into Sicily um, and made friends with people. And one went off to work for Eli Lilly, a pharma company in the US. He went to become a missionary in Borneo, and he went off the track, picked up some soil, sent it across, they discovered vancomycin, one of their potent antibiotics. So you can see there, the manic of no countries, no boundaries, some friendships. Here, try this, let's test it. Yeah, that was pretty simple. In my job, officially, I have about six months of paperwork and MTAs and NDAs. And Ethics approvals and import approvals and IBCs. I mean, I'm not joking, I have about 20 documents before I can do something. Sometimes in my job, I forgot what I was doing. By the time the paperwork comes through, I can't remember what the project was about. <laughs> so, again, okay, another example there uh, from the Philippines. So, that was a very productive time. And it was also pretty simple. Uh, what you needed was a trowel, which is on the left, getting used to the soil, a separation technology, which in this case is a big silica column. And then just like Fleming and Howard Florey, some bacteria, put the compound in the disc, does that compound kill bacteria or not? Then put it in a mouse, and then they went into man very, very quickly. 
So we're actually proposing to go back to the future, and in part in Michael J. Fox. <laughs> As I said, and this looks like spaghetti, I know, apologies for the non-druggists um, in the audience, but molecules are really weird. They don't obey the rules. So in some cases, we've actually become too clever. We've put all these different design rules and computational aids, et cetera, et cetera, but we've actually boxed ourselves into a narrow clinical space. Um, and also, um, you don't normally want reactive groups in your molecule. If a chemical is reactive, it could, what we what we call have off-target effects. So pharmaceutical companies have got rid of these types of molecules from their libraries because they're promiscuous binders. But a lot of these compounds are what we call suicide inhibitors, where the compound goes in, the bacteria grabs it, thinks it's a substrate it needs, and it's like a Trojan horse and it blows up. So we've become too clever to put too many rules there. So I don't like rules, <coughs> get rid of those. Let's go back to the future with a more open mind, or open head as Sati said, and look at this again. These are two technical slides because this is a science talk and have an access framework. So on the y-axis up there, we have the molecular weight or the size of the compound, how big it is. On the x-axis, kind of to simplify it, it's the polarity and the velocity of the compound, how greasy and how charged it is. What you can see in grey here, these are all drugs on the market. So this is for anything from Viagra to, you know, um, cisplatinum. Um, what you can see in red are compounds against gram-negative bacteria in particular. And you can just see, without being a, an expert, they're in a very different chemical space. Right? So the pharma companies own these libraries, they've screened them all, and there's no chemical space. But actually, the, where the antibiotics are is over here. So potentially, they're looking in the wrong place. It's one reason we're not finding the antibiotics. Okay, um, so we, we tested this with, with scientists. We had an hypothesis, go out and test it. We saw some commercial compound sets um, from Australia and overseas. We analysed these properties, and yes, they were in that narrow space. We then said, okay, let's go out and look at all published, and this is the power of open access, right? All published compounds ever in the history of mankind that have been antimicrobial, and boom, look at that. Right? Again, don't let me scientists, they're dramatically different. Okay, QED, how then can we access this space here it's not in the pharma libraries, but it's out there. So, antibody, antimicrobial drugs or antibiotics are different from normal drugs. The corporate libraries are not the answer, but these eclectic, diverse academic compounds out there, made by a whole variety of people for very different reasons, academics do crazy things, are interesting. So our mission is to screen for free. It is free. We will make no money out of this. We will get no publications out of this. We will create no IP. The university should fire me. Because all my KPIs say exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so you think about that, we have to think about the university metrics as well. Because there are some things that are for the greater good of mankind, right? But officially, if I'm stripped, this is exactly what I should not be doing. Um, but we've got a crisis. We've got to do something. There are probably more people talking about the superbug crisis than are actually working on it. Most of the funding goes on more studies, which are defining the problem. And it's kind of that thing, well, you know, the problem is this big. Well, is it this big or this big? I don't really care. I just know it's a big problem. So, <laughs> so one of the solutions, of course, is to challenge these models and help find new drugs. So we screen against some key bacterial pathogens and fungi. We're hoping to expand this now to tuberculosis, to dengue fever and malaria, and potentially one other disease. That is about 90% of the global burden of infectious disease on the planet today. So, a, a major uh, ambition. And it's global. There are other constraints in closed collections. There's the pharma libraries I told you about, which are rigidly closed. There's also big funding um, organisations in Europe, IMI. It's a great um, organisation, it's a great endeavour, but you have to be in the EU in order to receive funding. Um, we are little guys on the other end of the planet. We're just going to take them from anywhere. And so we've got cat plants from, from Russia, from Singapore, from America. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, so we've got a team, um, and they're doing a fantastic job. This is, uh, we have about 15 people full time. We've got to build the databases. We've got to build the laboratory information systems. We've got to build the outreach. We've got to go out and market ourselves, bring the brand equity. We've got to do the work, all the screening. Then we have to build the open access database and the ways to interpret it. So it's quite a bit of heavy lifting at the beginning. 
Um, that's it. Um, and what I will say, I'm not sure if that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So we've um, probably got more than 22 different uh, organisations involved. We've got India, Russia, Germany, China, Singapore. We're just starting to reach out to Africa. Of course, Australia, New Zealand, locally here as well. Um, this is a public good thing. We do need support. So there is a website, um, co-app.org, or if you just Google um, co-app or Google My Name Antibiotics, you'll find it. And if you just like us, or if you want to donate some funding towards the program, we would love to, uh, to hear from you. But what we're trying to do really is overcome this paradigm model of closed collections. We, longer term, if you think forward optimistically 10 years, we could have a million compounds or two million compounds and we'll have the email addresses of everybody, of people who are interested and engaged, who sent the compounds. And the other thing is these are synthetic. So the other thing people are looking at is going to deep caves and the barrier reef and oceans and trying to find you know, the last place we can have a look for antibiotics. But the problem with that is you may find one, but how do you get more of it? And that's often very good. They only grow at you know, those conditions. In this case, we know that that person was made by somebody in a lab somewhere, and we've got their email address. So if we need some more, if the compound works, it kills a superbug, it's looking great, we can give them a call and say, if you're interested, this is good results. Um, so in this model, there's no IP. The person that made the compound retains full rights and control. So they own all the data, they own all the compound. We ask them to provide the compound structure in 18 months' time. So after we finish all that screening, um, we say, OK, you've got 18 months to file papers or get funding. And that's important because in drug discovery, if you haven't protected that asset, you can't commercialise it. You know, it's still going to take $800 million to get that compound in the clinic, and so a, a pharmaceutical partner will not take that compound forward this is IP there. So they've got 18 months of grace period. If they need more, they can write to us, we'll give them a bit more time. But then that structure information, all the data about how that works and you know, where it will teach us about superbugs and antibiotics goes live. And then finally, of course, we, we have a bank. So we've talked about our World Bank of Money. We've talked about seed banks in Norway, which is where all of, you know, all of the countries, including North Korea, have put in molecule. They've, uh, as the Freudian said, they've put in uh, Put in seeds in there, we have, we have sperm banks, we have tissue banks. We've never thought about a molecule bank. And collectively, every day we make 15,000 compounds. There are over 100 million small molecules now that we've made, uh, of which 51 million organic. We think about 20 million of those have the potential to be screened for activity. And they're there, they're out there, they're real things. We've just got to access them. So that's COEP, it's an open access approach. It's built upon the basic thesis of open access and both to data and to compounds. And we're seeking to help solve the super problem with a community-based approach to drug discovery. Thanks for your time. Uh, that's where you, you, you know, risk reward, you try that crazy thing. Uh, 
And so I do think we're stifling innovation. Um, we have become too bureaucratic. You really want to trust the researcher to a degree. You know, are they, do they know what they're doing? They've got a reasonable track record. Give them the money, they can get on with it. You know, productivity is low in our business. It was a paper by Nick Graves, and he looked at the the amount of time academics would spend before they got one dollar of grant funding, and it was it was something like a two thousand to one ratio. I mean, it was easy, one of the most least productive users around. This year, and as you must see, expecting twelve percent success rates, one in eight. So we need to look at productivity in academia, and which means you, know, you can't do the research, raise the funding, and then be spending all your time on some of these papers.
Thank you very much. I'd just like to acknowledge and celebrate the First Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. My talk today is really going to look at uh, some of the issues associated with uh, intellectual property and the Creative Commons movement and its extension into bold new realms. So in particular, I'm going to be looking at Elon Musk uh, as uh, not only a kind of uh, entrepreneur from Silicon Valley, but also a uh, kind of <coughs> champion of open innovation, particularly in relation to clean technologies, uh, but also someone who's quite interested in using open licensing in relation to projects like SpaceX. Uh, just in terms of my own work, I, I mean, it's kind of been interesting thinking over the past couple of decades, the kind of the evolution of the Creative Commons movement. I kind of wrote a lot about the Creative Commons maybe about a decade ago as a kind of response to the enclosure movement that was taking place in relation to copyright law with stronger, longer rights in relation to copyright law being granted. And the efforts of setting up open licensing as a means of trying to resist that pressure. And I think the really fascinating thing that then took place was that model was then emulated in other realms. So in relation to biotech, uh, there was a kind of a race taking place in respect to the Human Genome Project. There was a public consortium and various private players filing gene patents. It was fascinating that the public researchers uh, made their genetic research available in an open fashion to try to stop and defeat gene patent claims um, by some of their rivals and competitors. And just the other week, the High Court of Australia handed down a very revolutionary decision 7-0, uh, ruling that myriad genetics, uh, gene patents in relation to testing for breast cancer and ovarian cancer uh, were invalid and were beyond the scope of what was payable because it was information that was in the Commons and available to all. Some very similar battles in relation to medicine as well. So the last week I had a, a big discussion about uh, battles over open and closed approaches in respect to medicine, and that's certainly been very pertinent in relation to access to medicines. Um, but today's talk, I guess, kind of comes out uh, of a little bit of a kind of concern in terms of uh, some of the evolution in terms of some of these debates. Um, in relation to the battle over plain packing tobacco products, it's kind of very interesting that uh, open, forced open data and information was kind of essential to that campaign. The tobacco industry lost key litigation and they were forced to have this truth serum and hand over all their internal documents uh, to the University of California in San Francisco and that then formed the basis of a lot of information uh, behind those um, movements. But my talk today really kind of comes a bit out of the work I've been doing on intellectual property and climate change. And I was kind of particularly interested in the Creative Commons movement, moving into the field of green exchanges and green licensing. So I'm kind of interested in Elon Musk is kind of partly coming out of that area. Uh, but lots of interesting issues in relation to IP, emerging technologies, openness versus closeness. Um, and sometimes I think um, some very kind of complex issues too in relation to uh, the open access movement and questions about Indigenous intellectual property and the need sometimes to preserve the confidentiality in relation to Indigenous intellectual property. Uh, I think that's also kind of a really interesting thing. Uh, but today I just want to talk a little bit about the Creative Commons movement, uh, talk about Tesla Motors and then finish up talking about the SpaceX project. So initially in relation to um, the Creative Commons uh, movement, um, really kind of has its origins in the kind of sticky licenses that were experimented with by Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation back in the 1980s and they kind of really rebelling against the uh, use of proprietary software by Bill Gates and Microsoft and uh, Richard Stallman, although he's a very eccentric figure, uh, nonetheless uh, came up with a genius idea of a sticky license that would ensure that code remained in the public domain and that subsequent users of the code also had to kind of abide um, by such contractual requirements. 
And then that model was then further elaborated in terms of open source licensing. So you had various fractures and fissures take place in relation to open licensing. And out of the rather, at times, dogmatic and authoritarian free software movement, uh, the open source licensing movement kind of took off and there were a wide range of commercial uses in relation to open source licensing that nonetheless used contract law to kind of keep the code uh, publicly available. And then uh, really a number of researchers, particularly uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig, seized upon on that kind of private contractual model and tried to have a much more general approach with the introduction of the Creative Commons movement, which would provide standardised blueprint contracts um, that would help make work more accessible. Uh, and really, uh, the organisation in some ways has been phenomenally successful, particularly with Wikipedia and Flickr and YouTube adopting Creative Commons licensing models. Uh, but in other ways, it's had some unintended consequences. I mean, often users of Creative Commons licenses use the more conservative, restrictive licenses that are available, rather than, technically speaking, the more open, public domain-based uh, licenses. Uh, and I, I guess there's also been kind of ongoing issues in terms of the sustainability of the, the movement. Uh, but really, I think it's kind of important also to recognise some of the limitations in respect of the Creative Commons movement. So the Creative Commons movement, in some ways, was a reaction against copyright term extensions that were kind of taking place, first in the European Union and then in the United States. Ryan Slesig ran a constitutional challenge against the Sunny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act in Albert versus Ashcroft. That was unsuccessful. A conductor from Denver uh, Lawrence Golan also brought an action against the constitutionality of one of the uh, copyright term extensions. That was a failure. So really, Creative Commons was a kind of an effort to respond to some of those efforts by using contract to keep things in the public domain because there was a kind of a concern that um, parliaments would block um, any kind of substantive copyright law reform action. The issue is kind of uh, become quite significant again with the Trans-Pacific Partnership proposing a copyright term extension. Uh, Australia had to uh, agree to a copyright term extension as part of the Australian United States Free Trade Agreement a decade ago. The countries like Canada and New Zealand have their public domain and cultural heritage under threat um, with the copyright term extension uh, provided by the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I think there's also been lots of kind of debates over copyright exceptions. So kind of particularly the question of the defence of fair use has become a very kind of pertinent one in Australia. We have a very limited purpose specific defence of fair dealing. Canada has a much more kind of dynamic defence of fair dealing, and the United States has no kind of defence of fair use. Uh, Professor John McHugh and others with the Australian Law Reform Commission recommend that Australia should follow the United States and adopt an open, flexible defence of fair use, or failing that, add some new defences uh, to the copyright exceptions available in Australia. Uh, but the coalition government under Tony Abbott and the Ray were kind of resistant to those proposals. Uh, the questions about copyright exceptions are going to be critical to kind of questions of open versus closed access. And the kind of problem of orphan works kind of remains a very kind of significant problem, particularly with very old forms of uh, copyright. Uh, so orphan works are where you can't identify the author of the work, or you can't locate the owner of the work, uh, which is an all too familiar problem. And there's been various different kind of policy solutions that have been proposed. Uh, Bruce Decayle, um, the digital library and the internet archive was very kind of concerned about the problem. Um, but that kind of remains a, a huge issue. And you can see it uh, in Australia with the uh, baked goods revolution of librarians and archives. It's cooking for copyright, protesting against perpetual um, protection in relation to unpublished copyright works. And that being kind of a particularly profound uh, problem if you want to kind of make culture open and accessible. Uh, and I guess there's also kind of larger issues here in terms of access to knowledge. So the 
Marrakesh Treaty on Copyright Law and Disability Rights uh, was accepted by the World Intellectual Property Organisation, and Australia is kind of currently debating the implementation of that regime. So I think it's kind of worthwhile also kind of thinking about how the debates are going and access connects to larger kind of questions about access to knowledge and questions about disability rights. But as I said, I mean, there's, there's something quite nostalgic having a week celebrating open access uh, just after there seems to be an agreement in Atlanta for there to be a Trans-Pacific Partnership, which promises longer, stronger copyright protection, uh, better protection of well-known trademarks, uh, stronger paid protection, particularly in relation to pharmaceutical drugs, and criminal penalties and procedures in relation to disclosure of trade secrets. Uh, so, you know, being open about confidential information could be uh, a criminal matter in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, so that, that's just kind of a little bit of an overview of our uh, current kind of environment. I mean, on a more kind of hopeful note, I, mean, I think there's been some really interesting extensions and applications of open licensing of late. And you know, some of the earlier speakers kind of talked about how the open access movement to inform cultural activities and information technology and nursing and biotechnology. Uh, and I guess I've been quite interested over the, the last year about how open licensing um, has also been taken up in relation to clean technologies. So Elon Musk, um, entrepreneur, associated initially with PayPal, um, and more recently with Tesla Motors and SolarCity and SpaceX, um, has been having a somewhat of a philosophical dilemma about whether or not to make his inventions open and accessible, or whether they can't keep them closed and under control. And last year, on the 12th of June 2014, Elon Musk announced in a blog that all our patents belong to you. He explained that the company would adopt an open source philosophy in respect of its intellectual property to encourage the development of the industry of electric cars and address the carbon crisis. Uh, so in his uh, usual uh, hyper-dramatic way, he said, yesterday there was a wall of Tesla patents in the lobby of our Palo Alto headquarters. That is no longer the case. They have been removed in the spirit of the open source movement for the advancement of electric vehicles. And he kind of maintained that we are to clear a path to the creation of compelling electric vehicles that then lay intellectual property landmines behind us to inhibit others will be acting in a manner contrary to that goal. So he kind of promised, somewhat vaguely, admittedly, Tesla will not initiate patents and lawsuits against anyone who in good faith wants to use our technology. And this statement has kind of attracted uh, a lot of interest as it kind of goes against the normal kind of traditional assumptions that companies should build a war chest of patent applications to defend their technology. Uh, but Tesla has instead uh, said that it will apply an open source philosophy um, to its various um, patents. And really, it's kind of an approach is to try to build the market. You know, they think that the market share that they have already, uh, you know, it's not enough. Uh, but really, they need to expand the market for electric cars. So Musk said, uh, true competition is not the small trickle of non-Tesla electric cars being produced, but rather the enormous flood of gasoline cars pouring out of the world's factories every day. He commented that there was a need to develop the innovation ecology in respect to electric cars. He said, we believe that Tesla, other companies making electric cars in the world, would all benefit from a common, rapidly evolving uh, clean technology platform. Uh, and it's been kind of noticeable that there's been a little bit of envy from some of the competitors to Tesla. So both uh, Toyota and Ford have announced that they are too uh, interested in open models in relation to sharing clean technologies. It's 
been fascinating that Musk has then been kind of taking some of those approaches and trying to apply it to some of his other ventures. Um, so Solar City uh, and the Gigafactory have been kind of key efforts of Musk to kind of help build capacity in relation to renewable energy and to batteries. Uh, but it's kind of a proposal for Tesla Energy is uh, quite fascinating in terms of wanting to kind of challenge the current domination of fossil fuel energy. So he's kind of particularly kind of keen on um, providing um, uh, energy innovation and he wants to kind of provide uh, new means of dealing with energy storage. Um, so in particular, it's got um, the product of the Tesla Powerwall, a rechargeable lithium-ion battery designed to store energy at a residential level for load shifting, backup power and self-consumption of solar generation, and they're going to um, also make their patents in respect of such technology available. And as I said before, some of the competitors like Toyota and Ford have tried to sometimes invoke uh, the rhetoric of openness. Uh, Toyota perhaps a little bit more than Ford. Some critics have suggested that Ford are really just using still quite close <coughs> licensing strategies. Just to wrap up, I think it's also kind of interesting to see how the open access movement has kind of gone into space as well with the SpaceX project. Uh, so Musk uh, not only is kind of interested in electric vehicles and energy storage, but he's also kind of quite interested in um, providing private uh, space missions. And he's kind of had an interesting, interesting kind of mixture of, of both quite closed approaches to intellectual property and quite open approaches to intellectual property. So in relation to SpaceX, he's kind of said that he, he sees no value in filing the patents because he thinks his competitors, particularly in China, will just read the patents and then copy his technology. So instead, he's kind of heavily relied upon confidential information to try to protect some of the key intellectual property um, surrounding SpaceX. Uh, but he's also been kind of the subject of, of a bit of discussion about what should happen in respect of um, some of the uh, key technologies um, associated with SpaceX. And there's been a bit of a discussion about it. is a closed approach better? Some academics like Audrey LaBelle kind of argue that really one of the reasons Silicon Valley has been so inventive is that it, it uh, shuns restricted covenants and allows staff to move from um, job to job, from firm to firm, and take their ideas and knowledge with them. Uh, but Musk has been kind of facing some interesting questions about copyright law. Uh, particularly in relation to photos taken in space. So initially, uh, you know, public space projects like NASA have made their photographs publicly available, open, accessible, and reusable for all. Uh, the Europeans are a bit more stingy, I'm afraid, when it comes to their space missions, and they try to apply copyright. Uh, but with the arrival of SpaceX, there's kind of an interesting question about, well, what should happen to the photos taken by SpaceX? Andrew Rush this year, an IP lawyer, commented on the position of SpaceX. SpaceX is not a government agency, unless the contract says otherwise, they own the copyright of anything they create. Just because they're operating on behalf of NASA it does not necessarily mean that copyright of the images are owned by NASA or the US government. When SpaceX is operating as a NASA contractor, generally any of the copyrightable stuff they create is subject to uh, copyrighted protections. Parker Higgins from the Electronic Crown and Deer Foundation kind of argued um, that he was kind of worried that you know, future copyright owners might enforce some of the pictures taken by SpaceX. He said, I don't think Elon Musk would authorise a copyright lawsuit against a kid who printed it out and put it on the science fair poster. Nonetheless, he was kind of worried about the future enforcement um, of copyright law, especially from the very long term. Um, in response, there was a kind of a concerted effort to lobby Elon Musk to kind of change his policy in respect of photographs for SpaceX. 
uh, he added a tech dirt like Mazak called on SpaceX to declare that it will put the images from its spacecraft into the public domain. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and in particular, um, there was an interest in some of the special versions that make the works available in the public domain. Uh, and just to show that Twitter is good for things, after uh, uh, you know, further discussion, Elon Musk was kind of pressed on Twitter that he, he would seem to be willing to accept Creative Commons licenses in relation to the SpaceX photographs. Uh, but after prompting from Pandemic, uh, he changed their licensing terms to full public domain uh, terms. So, kind of quite interesting in terms of that, that decision then led to further movement in relation to the use of public domain dedication. So Flickr then kind of followed what was happening in relation to Elon Musk and his space photography and decided it was going to make um, Creative Commons dedications to the public domain more widely available on a general basis. So I thought it was kind of a really kind of interesting example of open access and open innovation uh, and pushing forward uh, new frontiers in space but, but also in terms of making knowledge available and accessible uh, to all. Uh, so it would be interesting to see the quite long term debates about what forms of licensing is appropriate and adapted to um, some of the things that they're kind of interested in. Uh, so to kind of wrap up, I mean, I think today's talk is, talks have really kind of explored a number of different varieties of open access. We've kind of covered some very kind of traditional cultural applications in respect of uh, open access, as, as well as some, as some non-traditional cultural applications. There's been a great deal of innovation in relation to information technology and open access and biology and uh, open access. I think in relation to climate change, uh, kind of open access and open innovation over the data models kind of a really interesting way to help um, build a kind of critical mass, um, particularly in respect of uh, clean technologies to kind of tackle the global warming. So you know, open access is not just necessarily an end in and of itself. Open access has larger public policy benefits and applications for information technology and health and climate change as well. That's all. Thank you very much. That was, that was tremendous. From, I, I feel like, you know, it's incredibly, um, I think, uh, uh, interesting that Back to the Future Day has fallen in our own week. The sort of various themes around that being discussed there. And, uh, I think, the technology that we're talking about is going to be relevant. So, questions for. Okay, so, can I ask one? I think um, this issue about how you interna internationally harmonise things it seems to be really important with regard to you know, licensing and patents. And that doesn't seem to be. I mean, is the TPP going to be bad for that? Is that something we should be looking for? I mean, I know you're going to be to. What's the role of international harmonisation? Well, I mean, the trans pacific Partnership is an agreement that spans the Pacific Rim that involves a dozen different nations. Uh, it's been very noticeable that Japan and the United States oppose the inclusion of language on the public domain in the agreement. It's very striking that all the elements of the intellectual property chapter uh, that's available on WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks got part of the final version of the intellectual property chapter and made online. Uh, the measures dealing with the enhancement of the rights by IP owners and mandatory obligatory, whereas a lot of the language about uh, copyright exceptions like fair use or patent exceptions or trademark exceptions are merely discretionary. Uh, I mean, I think there's some very kind of significant impacts flying from that agreement. I mean, really, it, it uh, bears all the hallmarks of an intellectual property maximalist regime, uh, and it really is very noticeable, particularly in relation to copyright law, uh, Disney, and 
Collingwood have pushed for long protection. Um, but the copyright industries have also pushed for some of the measures in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, like digital logs and electronic rights management information, which might help keep things locked up. Uh, but there's also kind of an arsenal of civil offences and criminal offences and border measures. So copyright owners are going to have a wide array of remedies to tackle a whole host of different issues. Um, but as I said before, there's also some very kind of concerning measures in relation to patents and trademarks and a lot of debate about data protection and biologics and the emphasis upon trade secrets is, is also kind of very striking. Um, so that, that's a very kind of particular paradigm in terms of dealing with intellectual property. And as I said, I mean, I think there's a real cultural clash between the open access movement, the way that is, the it has, and the kind of legal regimes that are attempting to be imposed across kind of particular regions. And there's, there's limits to what you can do in terms of open licensing. Uh, so, so that can help if you're in a particular relationship with someone. But uh, really you need law reform to achieve true open access. There's, there's a limit to what you can do by private contract. You yeah. do need to change the private rules as well. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a kind of a disturbing moment in some ways uh, in terms of the IP empire striking back yeah. against the open access movement uh, in very significant ways. I just um, I love, I'm absolutely fascinated by you know the mask is uh, you know the world was full of people like you know the players. Um, I was fascinated by his press launch where he did a little evil thing. You know, um, and at that point, I did think to myself, is this too good to be true? Is perhaps he opening up a, the biggest freemium model on the planet, comparing us all to his? Um, his new work, new world order of electric cars, so that he can then unleash the next version 1.2 of the gigabit factory that went all to so his basically places Saudi Arabia. I'm just wondering if that little finger or <laughs> struck that chord. <laughs> Is Elon Musk evil? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ashley Barnes has a nice new biography of Elon Musk. Uh, and, and he's certainly a very kind of colourful figure in many ways. So, much like many Silicon Valley Promethean entrepreneurs, he seems to attract very polarised views between you know, those who see him as a heroic entrepreneur and those who see him as something of a, a megalomaniac, one way or another. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think his <coughs> projects are kind of quite interesting, particularly in relation to renewable energy. I mean, I think, I think there is quite a live debate about to what extent is Musk's approach truly open? So some critics have said that he hasn't necessarily been very transparent about the licensing models that he's proposing. And I guess there's a question about to what extent would he allow true competition to pick up his patents and exploit them and use them? Uh, but you know, I think that's a kind of a really kind of interesting <coughs> part of the debate uh, in, in terms of what will happen with all these various innovations. But he, he's certainly been quite a fierce competitor, so I, mean, I think a lot of the you know, traditional car makers and retailers tried to lock him out of certain markets, uh, and they seem to overcome that. NASA were very kind of keen on him bidding uh, in relation to private space rockets, and he, he tried to he really kind of got around that block in the end. Um, so so it's, he kind of is very interested in certain forms of kind of disruptive innovations. I, I, I guess it sounds like your point is also a kind of a longer historical one. I mean, I think, you know, Steve Jobs famously with Apple started out promoting an open approach in relation to information technology, and now Apple has such a closed ecology in relation to its products. And they use lineups to do it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, you know, in some ways, um, have repudiated that past. So, I, I mean, I think that's kind of an interesting question. Sometimes behaviour changes 
when you become a market leader. While it might be fashionable to promote open innovation when you're still a kind of a plucky, scrappy uh, newcomer, uh, when companies become more mature, particularly from Silicon Valley, that, that had sometimes affected the approach to IP. You'd have to say the same about Google as well. You know, I hope some Google being a white knight in some of the intellectual property debates has not necessarily been realised. They've had much more kind of conflicted interests than we kind of perhaps first anticipated. So, good point. There's a question in front as well. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's Mark from uh, the Centre of Health Economics. So it might, it's kind of aimed, I guess, at both maths in a way. Um, one of the things, I guess, is the, the pharmaceutical companies you mentioned there are trying to get better um, IP and patent control. And I just wonder how come we can see like some of the computer industry a bit of pressure and they'll you know, be more open about their processes, whereas in the pharmaceutical industry, is a, it's a lot more difficult to to get through that kind of a process, and I guess it, you know, looking at the, the antibiotic model that you're, you're you're proposing, at the end of it, those drugs will have to come, those molecules will have to come true to fruition. And that will cost money, of course, but they will be under a closed patent because the drug company who brings it forward will have paid the person who found the molecule, and we end up with a very very expensive drug that um, has basically a. a uh, market that, is, it, that has no competitors. So I'm just wondering, is there, it's kind of twofold, is there a way of trying to prevent that happening when you've got a nice open model like that? And as well, how do we put pressure on the pharmaceutical industry to be more open about their patents, especially considering that they're making money from health? Whereas these companies are only making money from technology, which is very important to people's lives, but it's not affecting their life or death. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so there's some good points. Um, they are they're very old companies. You know, we talked about some, you know, these, all these companies we heard about uh, last talk are a decade old. Bay Area is 150 years old. And so they're very old established conservative companies, and particularly those in, in Germany and Switzerland. Um, that said, they're, um, they're starting to do open access. They kind of they want their cake and eat it too, so they'll have open access to them. They want you to sign up to it, signing all your data to them, so that's not open access, right? In the antibiotic models, the Obama's Prenatal Advisory Committee on this, and the um, Pew Trust and the London School of Economics, we're, we're looking at different models of societal value of an antibiotic or a drug versus the economic value, because you're right, if, you, if it costs X to get the drug to market, the companies will sell it for $4,000 a course. We pay $100,000 for a cancer medicine, $30,000 for a cancer medicine, we just don't think about that, and it gets reimbursed. We expect to pay $20 for an antibiotic, right? So, so the pricing model needs to change. Two ways to do that, extend the patent lifetime, unfortunately, right? which is a simple way, because you, your MPV improves. Uh, price, a very simple lever, your MPV. But then if you don't use it, it's driven on volumes, you may have a fantastic drug, but it's kept on reserve. And because it's the last drug against the superbug, so you don't use that. So the simplest way there is think of it as an insurance policy. You get health insurance, you get car insurance. So we're looking at a voucher model. That if you launch a drug to the market, you just launch it, it's approved, you get a payment of 200 or 400 million dollars, whatever it is. And that just says, great, you can pay off your research, the MPV changes, and you don't have a long-term driven economic return. Uh, but that means society has to say, okay, we're prepared to pay 400 million dollars from the government uh, in order to have this insurance policy there. And if you don't say that to the public, most people would say, well, you know what, it's obviously 400 million for each of us, but maybe it's $2 for Medicare. Um, yeah, I'd probably pay that, because I'm a bit worried that I might get an infection in hospital. So that thinking is, is coming, but the industry is very conservative compared to fast moving tech, where you can get value in 10 years. I mean, end endless battles in relation to paying back months and trying. So the usual rule is you can get 20 years protection for a patent, but for some pharmaceutical drugs, they can push it up for another five years. Lots of issues in relation to the patent cliff, when the patent is going to expire, particularly if it's a blockbuster patent. Um, often, uh, there has then been kind of battles over direct patent term extensions or indirect evergreening in relation to patent <coughs> between brand name pharmaceutical companies and generic companies. It's 
been further complicated with new rules about data protection and biologics. It's been very controversial, particularly in relation to access to essential medicines for HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and tuberculosis. Um, and you know, nation states have often invoked public interest powers like compulsory licensing and crown use to make drugs accessible at an affordable price. Uh, but often drug companies have tried to fight back against such measures. Particularly kind of focused upon India because India is the main kind of supply of generic medicines. So lots of you know, conflict in relation to uh, India and the country. Uh, but really there's also uh, great pressures uh, afoot in terms of the drug industry wants to try to get strong protection in relation to both pharmaceutical drugs and new generation products like biotech and synthetic biology and pharmacogenomics, um, particularly because they're blockbuster drugs that come to an end of their lives. But huge kind of issues about affordability in terms of cost uh, and also kind of questions in terms of access. Um, and you know, it was very kind of noticeable that one of the key sticking points of the trans pacific partnership was special protection for biologics. Obama was on the phone demanding that Malcolm Turnbull accept an extension to, of 12 years special protection for biologics. And I think Turnbull, to his credit, kind of resisted those demands. But I think it probably gives him an idea of the importance of the issue, if that's one of the key outstanding issues at the end of this kind of big blockbuster trade agreement, is you know, the length of time of protection for special sorts of biologics. So one quick thing, a really easy thing that they could do, we could all do as academics or in the industry, is publish papers. So you go into metrics, right? I mean, there's one or two journals which is the journals of results that don't work. But to be honest, in our metrics, people don't like that. I get credit for it. That's the key thing. Yeah, you know, so you should publish photos, because there's obvious reasons. Pharmaceutical companies, the one thing they have in abundance is tox data. And they've been in a lot of trouble. You know, Biox and Merck, because that was a multi-billion dollar suit. But again, if we can encourage the industry to publish failures early, everybody benefits from that. And there's very little cost to that particular company. So that's simple, risk-free, open access data, but to negative data, which is very, very helpful to everybody. Okay, we're almost at time. Are there any final questions for the speakers? I think this has been a fantastic session. Um, I, I feel like it's almost epitomised for all the things that um, we really value in open access, which is collaboration across groups. I've learned a lot from music, I have things I have never thought about. I'm really heartened by the idea of open peer review for some people actually like to do it and mm -hmm. embrace it, that kind of stuff is really important. And I hope it's given you lots of stuff to think about for our week. Um, I just want to thank some people who helped organise this. So um, there are several people who involved, lots of people involved. So Anthony Lay from Griffith and Therese, who's known as Brown from Griffith, and Griffith giving us this lovely space, which was very nice. Um, Paula Callan and Stephanie Bradbury, Stephanie's not here from, from uh, QUT, and from UQ, Amber and Thomas, Elena Danilova, um, and Tanya Siegel. So lots of people put time to do this. And we also have some gifts for our speakers.